Welcome to our final session of the program titled Clinical Management in the Near Future. My name is Jonathan Shapiro. I'm from the National Hemophilia Center at Shiva Medical Center in Tel Aviv. We'll have three talks followed by a panel discussion. Our first talk will be from Professor Kia Ruxrumtrum on two versus three drugs, relevance for the Asian settings. This will be followed by a talk by myself on harnessing technology to assist in the treatment of experienced patients. And finally, we'll have an update on long-acting therapies from Professor Mark Boyd. With that, let me introduce our first speaker. Kia Ruxrunfram is Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine at Chula Longcorm University and Scientific Chair of the Chula Vaccine Research Center. He is providing teaching and patient care at King Chula Longcorm Memorial Hospital mentoring junior researchers on HIV, vaccines, immunology, and clinical trials. He has published more than 280 peer-reviewed papers on these topics. He's been very active both nationally and internationally in the global fight against AIDS, chairing the research committee of the Thai Royal College of Physicians, as well as serving as the deputy director of HIVNET and the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. He is recipient of many awards including the Outstanding Researcher Award and the Highest Citation Award, Chula Longcorn University, and the Outstanding Researcher Award of Thailand. We're honored to have Professor Rex Rumpton speak to us on two versus three drugs, relevance for the Asian settings. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for your kind introduction. So what I'm going to do in the next uh, 18 minutes is to cover topic of two drug versus three drugs uh, regimen, how the implementation can be considered in, in, in this region. This is my disclosure. There's a, a, a rationale or uh, argument to, to support uh, dual drug therapy. I think the first uh, rationale is uh, to reduce side effects. Less, less the number of drugs in the regimen uh, has a better potential to reduce side effects. Uh, and also, we allow it to reserve future options and also uh, a significant cost saving uh, can be achieved as well. Now, what we have learned in the past based on uh, in in, in uh, a nucleoside uh, liver transcriptase inhibitor in the last uh, two, three decades is that uh, definitely we should not uh, prescribe any monotherapy at all, no matter it's, uh, you know, it's uh, NRTI, NRTI or any other regimen. Uh, secondly, but again, keep in mind back in two or three decades ago, if we're talking about two drugs, it means only uh, two in RTI, so or no. Uh, so it's not good. Within a few weeks, to, uh, a month, you're going to see a rebound of the bilimia and uh, drug-resistant development. So we are all familiar with the uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy or three-drug uh, regimen. Now, um, I think in the past uh, decade, uh, since 2007, that uh, a lauticavir available, so it's the first integrase inhibitor in the class available, and you know, five years later we have elvitikavir boosted, and uh, another year we have dorotikavir, and and uh, recently we have betikavir. It's clearly that this class as a monotherapy study. Uh, after uh, seven to 14 days uh, receiving this uh, class of uh, therapy as a mono proof of the concept, you can see that it's a very potent uh, ARV uh, in these uh, integrase inhibitors. Uh, that is, um, in general, is more than two log reduction in the first or second week as the monotherapy proof of the concept study. And more importantly, 
uh, a few of them in this class, particularly Dorotecovir, Bitecovir has a, a high drug resistant barrier uh, property. And you can see that the, the Lorotecovir is among uh, uh, the integrase inhibitor in this group that uh, have a lower uh, drug resistant uh, barrier, genetic resistant barrier, while the Dorotecovir and Particular has uh, less than 0.1% risk of dropping drug resistance. So I would like to, you know, make a, a point here that the current two drug regimen is not like the two decade or three decades two drug regimen. So two drug no best therapy is not the same as uh, integrase inhibitor based two drug regimen. So you can see that uh, uh, the, the sustainability and the magnitude of viral suppression uh, in this uh, you know, uh, plot uh, is, is really uh, a case that uh, the current two drug regimen is performed more uh, potent and durable compared to the two nodes. Uh, therapy. So what I'm going to focus here is uh, a, a main uh, three dual uh, regimens. So um, two are all of is the Dorotecovir, Lamivudine, DTG, 3 tc and Dorotecovir, Lepivarin, uh, oral. And the other one is a long-acting injectable uh, Carbotecovir and the Pivarin's combination. Um, if we look at the approval status, um, interestingly, the two oral uh, two drug regimen it has been approved as a single tablet regimen. Uh, in this case, is a, a Dovato uh, for a DTG TTC as a trip name. Uh, have been approved for, uh, recently uh, in April last year. Uh, the indication is the first for first line, and and then later on, uh, uh, you know, uh, have with the clinical trial uh, uh, support, uh, have also indicated for Swiss regimen. The second one is the Juluka uh, for DTG repurin. Approved uh, back in 2017. Uh, this is mainly for a uh, switch regimen. So in people has been uh, well suppressed with other regimen for at least six months. For for the long acting injectable, the uh, uh, you know carbotecovir repuvulin um, is pending in the U.S. for the approval but has been approved in, the, in Canada uh, early next year, this year. Again, this is a, it's a switch option in a while suppress uh, patients and after an oral lead in with oral carbotecovir plus oral lipurine. I, I just give uh, some of the uh, results to, to, to emphasize that how this uh, dual uh, regimen uh, got approval by uh, the FDA. Uh, this is uh, for the naive uh, populations. Uh, this is a Gemini 1, Gemini 2, uh, virologic response uh, up to week 96. And you can see that uh, this, uh, this is the data based on uh, percentage of uh, participants uh, have shown viral load below 50 copy per meal. And uh, in orange uh, is, uh, is the three drug regimen. So this is TDF, FTC, plus DTG. And uh, in blue is uh, the DTG, 3TC as a dual regimen. So this is uh, uh, as a non-inferiority uh, 
met uh, criteria. And, uh, but I, I think when they have done a post hoc analysis, uh, this is a subgroup analysis to looking at, uh, to address the concern whether uh, dual therapy of DTG, 3TC uh, in uh, very high viral load based lives individuals or low CD4 at the cutoff of 200 cells count has any different uh, compared to the three drug regimen. Uh, I like to keep in mind before we interpret the data, if you look at the sample size of this subgroup analysis is only uh, 13 to 15 per arm in the, in the high viral loss baseline as a cutoff of 500,000 copy and uh, about 55 to 63 uh, individuals and uh, per arm in the a low CD4 cutoff at 200. So, but in this uh, observation, you can see that uh, there's a, a different uh, uh, percentage of viral suppression, 80 uh, versus uh, 69 in the high uh, baseline viral load at the cutoff of 500,000 copy, and 87 uh, in the three drug regimen versus 68 at the low CD4 cutoff at 200 cell count. So how the international guidelines uh, for uh, adult HIV treatment uh, recommended for first line uh, treatment. Um, so I highlight in here, this is based on the most recent guideline uh, of the DHHS in 2019 and the uh, European guideline 2019 you can see that both have recommend uh, are those uh, uh, are not all has a preferred regimen, recommend regimen, uh, dual therapy, DTG, 3TC as a first line therapy. Uh, in, in, I, I like to touch on a little bit on the, uh, the recommendation. It's clearly that Dorotecovir, Lamivudine, or DTG, 3TC, a dual regimen is not recommended in these three settings uh, based on the DHHS guidelines. The first one is uh, individual with a high baseline viral load above 500,000 copy per meal. And uh, individuals with hepatitis B uh, viral infection should not be uh, given this regimen because uh, we will end up with uh, 3 to c monotherapy for hepatitis B treatment. And in case that, uh, we, because we are implementing rapid ART or same day ART. So if uh, we decide to start the treatment, uh, fertilized treatment regimen before uh, getting a genotypic resistant testing results, particularly for our liver transcript test gene, or for the hepatitis B testing, uh, this regimen should not be uh, considered as a, a first line at the beginning. Now, what about uh, a maintenance or switch uh, option? Uh, how well the DTG 3TC uh, has been performed in the clinical phase three trial? So this is a tango uh, results based on uh, 48 weeks uh, snapshot analysis. As you can see that uh, in blue is a two drug regimen DT DTG 3TC and uh, in orange is a continual uh, path-based uh, triple regimen. And so uh, the finding again confirmed that this is a non in uh between the two arms. The other, uh, move to another uh, two drug regimen, DTG lepivirine uh, in the transferred one and two results. Uh, this, the study design uh, based on uh, the sample size is uh, uh, more than a thousand uh, individuals then uh, who have been well suppressed with 
uh, a stable uh, treatment regimen. Uh, basically, is a uh, two NRTI plus either integrase inhibitor and an RTI of protein uh, boosted protease inhibitor uh, with viral load below 50 copy per mil for at the minimum of six months at the screening. And uh, with no previous viral virological failure, uh, no curling hepatitis B infection, and no resistance to DTGR or repurine, and randomized into a switch to uh, the dual drug regimen DTG repurine, or maintain the baseline ART. So the sample size, uh, uh, you know, per arm is about 100, uh, 500 uh, individuals. Uh, and the data at the primary endpoint at 48 week, you can see that again, this, uh, uh, the proportion of patient uh, remain well suppressed below 50 cutoff of viral load uh, at, uh, you know, at that's uh, reaching a criteria of non inferiority And when they follow up to uh, week 100, uh, the, the sustainability is still, you know, 89% with the early switch uh, arm and 93% in the late switch arm. Now, how, how the, uh, the international guideline, in this case, European is a clinical society guideline have uh, recommend in terms of uh, dual ART at a switch options. So now they recommend five dual drugs uh, switch uh, option uh, for biologically suppressed uh, individuals. Uh, so they, uh, this include the DTG lepivirine, DTG 3 uh, boosted darunavir with uh, lamivudine, boosted atosanavir with uh, lamivudine, and boosted uh, darunavir with uh, lepivirine. But keep in mind that the wild load has to be, has been uh, undetectable for at least six months and no evidence of lamivudine resistance or, or, or uh, NNRTI resistance and no uh, evidence of chronic hepatitis B infection. Now let's focus a bit more on these lesions. Uh, how available of these two drug regimen and, and, and uh, in, in implementation in this region. Uh, when I look at uh, the availability of single tablet regimen of this dual uh, all of uh, uh, regimen, so um, Dovato and uh, Juloka, uh, only available uh, or approved by the uh, country FDA in the high income countries. So in, in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan, but not at all in the low middle income country, including Thailand. Uh, and of course, uh, injectable long acting uh, is, is, is not yet available in this region. So uh, let me focus a bit more uh, in, in Thailand uh, because we 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 practicing this uh, dual therapy and how this has been going. Uh, it's clearly that uh, in a word uh, the new Thai guideline going to be out by the end of this year is uh, consider DTG treaty C as an alternative first line legend. It's not the prefer first line regimen. Uh, the reason behind that, because uh, we, we don't, uh, the, the national uh, universal coverage uh, program uh, want to support uh, baseline viral load testing and drug resistance testing in general. We go, going to, uh, the country will support only the uh, monitor uh, viral load testing and drug resistance when uh, biological failure is indicated. So, so with this, I think it's the risk that if we start uh, DTG treaty C as a preferred first line regimen. In terms of uh, uh, the 
implementation that uh, has been um, used uh, in the clinical practice is uh, is uh, you know a first line or switch option in patient with poor renal function. Um, so it is uh, uh, contraindicated for, to to use a uh, tenofovir TDF, and uh, a TAP is not widely available in our country. And we again we have to make sure that uh, we confirm that this is no hepatitis B viral co-infection and no history of uh, 3TC drug resistance. Um, one different thing is that, I as I mentioned, that the single tablet regimen of DTG 3TC is not uh, approved in Thailand. It's not available. So we have to go with three pure regimen. So one tablet of DTG and two tablet of 3TC. In terms of DTG lepivirine, clinical implement, implementation in Thailand, uh, this can be a Swiss treatment option, particularly in patients with poor renal function uh, and have no history of NNRTI resistant or integrase uh, uh, inhibitor resistant. Uh, however, this regimen uh, has been less commonly used than DTG 3 um, There's uh, some a, a reason behind because the first thing is this is a meal restriction due to uh, the puberine in the regimen. Secondly, the puberine is contraindicated in, in individual uh, when they have to take uh, uh, PPIs in, uh, you know, for treatment of haptic ulcer. The other consideration when we using Doroticovir containing the dual therapy is a drug drug interaction. Although it's, a, it's not a, a many drug drug interaction uh, when we're talking about Doroticovir. However, there are uh, some major drug interaction that need to be taken to the account. The first one is the when we is con it contraindicate. Uh, to, uh, to be used DTG with uh, anti-arrhythmic, in this case, uh, dofetiran. And when doroticovir have to be taken by uh, carbamazepine uh, or like fampin, uh, to, we have to make sure that uh, additional 50 milligram dose need to be added. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kia, for a wonderful talk. I look forward to discussing that more during our roundtable. And we'll move now to my talk titled, Harnessing Technology to Assist in the Treatment of Experienced Patients. These are my exposures. So I think the interaction between clinicians and technology must be approached with caution. It's important to be wary of situations where this will replace good clinical judgment reduce responsibility, or distance us from our patients. Technology must be harnessed to assist us in making decisions where it improves care, not jeopardizes it. Examples may be adding expertise and saving time when addressing very specific clinical questions. And one such example, which is currently available, is using technology to assist us in translating resistance and pharmacology to treatment decisions. Now, both pharmacology and resistance are very important when we're considering clinical decisions. Resistance will usually limit the drugs we can use in a patient due to loss of activity. Pharmacology will usually limit the drugs we can use since either their level or the level of other drugs the patient is taking will be too high or too low. An example for resistance can we use efavirenz in a patient who has the RT mutation K103N? Well, we can't because K103 gives resistance to efavirenz. And for pharmacology, can we use rilpivirine with rifampicin? Well, we can't because the levels of rilpivirine will be too low. And another example, can we use the runavir with simvastatin 
No, we can't because the levels of simvastatin will be too high. So usually both resistance and pharmacology will limit our options. But in some cases, rare cases, they'll actually increase our activity. So if you have a patient who has for resistance, the RT mutation M184V, it'll increase activity of AZT. And similarly, as you probably know, of tenofovir. And for pharmacology, if you take your dilutegra with food, it's actually gonna boost its levels uh, nicely by about 30%. So in most cases, resistance and pharmacology actually reduce our activity, but in some they increase it. And what's for sure is we have many, many mutations impacting many, many drugs. And we have the patient often taking more than one antiretroviral and taking many co-medications. And there's a lot to know and a lot to consider before making decisions. So what's certain is that this is very complicated and to use this in clinical practice requires a lot of expertise and a lot, a lot of time. So let's use technology to help us. And we actually have two very nice systems. One for resistance is the Stanford database. And the second for pharmacology is the Liverpool website. So for resistance, we have the Stanford database, which is of course founded and maintained at the highest scientific standard by my friend and colleague, Bob Schaefer. And you simply can go to the website uh, and this will give you an interpretation of a resistance test. Now, resistance interpretations are important guide in new regimen. They help us estimate the remaining activity of each drug. And based on this, we can combine drugs with sufficient activity to give us a productive new regimen. Now, the Stanford database does this by giving a score or a penalty actually for each mutation to each drug. And based on the final total score, you can see how much uh, resistance is present. And you can see as the score gets higher, you have more and more resistance, less and less activity. And all you have to do, you go to the website, you click on the program, and you can enter the mutations uh, into the system. Now resistance tests uh, are important and the Stanford database and other systems uh, will help you decide which drugs uh, you can use. But, and I think this is very important, it's only one of many factors which will help us compose the optimal regimen for each patient. Another key consideration is of course pharmacology. And for that, we have the Liverpool uh, website and here too, you open a menu and you can enter the drugs the patient is getting, both the antiretrovirals and the additional co medications the patient may need. Now, you can do it on the website or you can download the app to your smartphone and you see you have this both on Google Play and the App Store and you can do this uh, from your phone. So let's do a clinical case together and see how we actually can implement these tools, these, this technology into helping us uh, with treating the patient, uh, but not replacing our good clinical judgment. So here's a patient. It's an HIV-infected male hemophiliac. He's 40 year, years old and is all hemophiliacs. He's been positive uh, for over 30 years. He's married. He has a good job. He's always excellent adherence. And he has comorbidities of hemophilia, of course, but also hypertension and hyperlipidemia. So over the years, as many uh, patients who've been infected this long, the patient has failed many, many drug regimens. As you can see, a number of NRTIs, multiple PIs, going back both to our unboosted PIs and our boosted PIs, uh, NRTIs, and even uh, an integrase inhibitor. Currently, the patient's on tenofovir and fricitabine with lopinavir, ritonavir, and raltegravir, and he's failing. Viral load is now 2100 and CD4 count is 318. And for reference, the patient's peak viral load uh, was 90,000 copies. Resistance test was performed now, and we also have previous resistance tests. And if we take and combine all the results for resistance on the patient, we see a lot of mutations, which of course 
is not a surprise and consider all the regimens. You can see the NRTI mutations, 41, 67, 74, 184, 215, 219. NRTI mutations, 181 and 100. PI mutations, 33, 46, 54, 84, 90. Integrase mutations, 155 and 121. And for tropism, the patient actually uh, is already dual tropic. So we're going to have to consider all these mutations and all our drugs and figure out which drugs are going to work best. That, that's a lot to do. But we do now have a very specific question we can ask the technology to help us with. So do we have a specific question? Absolutely. What we want to know is which drugs still have the most activity. We could do it ourselves, but boy, would we be happy if someone could quickly and at a very high scientific level do this for us. So we simply go to the Stanford database, free, opened on the web, and we click on the program. And indeed, it gives us here the ability to enter the mutations of this individual patient. Now you can do it by clicking on the mutation, you can copy paste, or actually if you're a lab director, you can simply upload it to the system. So let's enter all those RT mutations we have. And you see here we have uh, six mutations. And then we enter our protease mutations and our integrase mutations. And then we ask the system to analyze these and give, me, and give us the results. And we can see here for RT, we get the level of resistance for the different drugs, both for the NRTIs and for the NRTIs. And actually, if you want, you can see the specific score, which will give you the best resolution. So you can see here on top all the drugs, and you can see all the mutations and an individual penalty. And at the bottom, you get the bottom line, what's the number? And the higher the number, the more resistance you have. The lower the number, the more activity that's remaining both for NRTI and NRTI. And in fact, if you want, you can go and get very detailed why the system is giving you the result. This, of course, if you have time and perhaps you want to learn, but of course, you don't need to do this. Here for the protease, we also have the levels of resistance. And if you want, you can also go look at the score and you can consider here which of these drugs actually has the lowest score. And you can see the suggestion here based on the three boosted RT uh, protease inhibitors. And finally, our integrase inhibitors. Levels of resistance and scores uh, for each of the individual drugs. Which of the drugs with the lowest score, which will have the most remaining activity? Now, if you put all these together, you will see that it actually shows us who has the most remaining activity from the NRTIs. Uh, actually, for the NRTI, there's a suggestion of deravirine, but this drug has not been studied uh, in this patient population at all, although it'd be nice if it were. Perhaps it could give us activity. For the integrase inhibitors, both Bictegravir and Dilutegravir have low level resistance, uh, but once again, Bictegravir was not studied in this patient population. Actually, Dilutegravir has a dose for treatment experienced patients, uh, which allows us to give it twice a day. And finally, for the boosted PIs, we also have the drug with the most activity. So we asked a very specific question, which drugs still have the most activity? And very quickly, and at a high scientific level, the system gave us an answer, saving us a great deal of time and probably also a lot of learning to get to this level of expertise. So we take that regimen, tenofovir and tricitabine, with boosted darunavir twice a day, and dilutegravir twice a day, and we're gonna give it to our patient. Are we ready to go? Anything missing? Let's go back to the case, and let's remember that there were comorbidities, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, perhaps the patient's getting drugs for those diseases as well, and indeed he is. For his hypertension, ramipril, and for his hyperlipidemia, a torvastatin at a dose of 60 milligram once a day. So here we have the Liverpool website, which can help us uh, look at these interactions. We can also do it on our smartphone if we've downloaded the app. And what we really wanna know is these are the drugs we wanna give the patient for treatment. 
And these are the drugs the patient is currently getting for his comorbidities. And what we actually are asking are, what are the interactions, if any, between these and how can we manage them? Once again, we have a specific question we want help with from the technology. Please tell us, are there interactions between these drugs? So once again, in Liverpool, you simply open the website or the app and you can enter here all the antiretroviral drugs and the co-medications. Very simple, you click on them and here you can see we have the delutegavir, the tenofovir, the emtricitabine, and the boosted darunavir, and our atorvastatin and ramipril. And we're going to ask the system, are there interactions? How can we manage them? And when you click, you can see a list here. And actually, the only one with a potential interaction is the darunavir ritonavir. Now, it also says you can switch to the table view, and it'll look like this. And you see on top there, the different antiretrovirals, and on the side, the drugs that are co-medications, and it's very easily color-coded. For the ramipril, there's no problem. There's no interaction for all of them. But for the atorvastatin, there is what we see here, a potential interaction. And if you click on it, it'll actually tell you what the problem is and how you can try to deal with it. But if you don't want to start dealing with interaction, there's also an alternative to simply look for other drugs. So if you don't want to try to manage interaction, but just avoid it, you can click on to look for alternatives and it'll open for you the list of the other drugs which can lower the lipids. And you can see maybe there's something you can use that doesn't have an interaction. For example, in our patient, the atorvastatin, there's an interaction, but for patavastatin, there isn't. So if you can get patavastatin, you can simply use it instead of atorvastatin and there's no problem. Now, where I practice, I didn't have it. So I couldn't use that option, but for those who could, it's worth checking. So we go back to our Torvastat and we say, okay, how can we manage this interaction? And what it simply tells us is that actually the Darunav Rotonavir is increasing the level of Torvastatin, so we wanna make sure it's not too high. And the recommendation actually is to go down to the lowest dose to actually 10 milligrams, see if you get enough activity, if you're not getting toxicity, and slowly increase it, but not go above 40 milligrams. That doesn't seem too complicated. So that's indeed what we did. We gave the patient the tenofovir and tricitabine with the darunavir and dilutegavir, but we reduced the dose of atorvastatin. Instead of giving 60, we gave 10. The patient did not have toxicity, but we didn't quite get the lipid response we wanted. So we increased to 20, and at 20, it was great. The lipids went down nicely, and there was no toxicity. Ramapril, we continued the standard dose, and actually we encountered no toxicity of any drugs, and adherence continued to be excellent. And I can give you actually two-year follow-up, today actually much more. Viral load, rock solid, tolic and detected, CD4, 480, and both the LDL and the blood pressure are all excellent. So I think additional new technologies will likely be incorporated into routine HIV care in the near future. It's important for us clinicians to consider how best to integrate them to the benefit of the patients and the clinicians. Now, understanding what specific function of patient care they can augment is a key first step. And then finding where and to what extent they can be best implanted should then be considered. Optimally, they should not replace any degree of responsibility, clinical judgment, or interaction with patients and I think the best approach is early collaborations uh, between clinicians, pa patients, and the folks uh, who are developing uh, these technologies for us. With that, let me acknowledge my friends and colleagues from the National Hemophilia Center who do all the work so I can give talks, and a special acknowledgement to the people who have brought us uh, these amazing systems. Um, Robert Schaefer, for 30 years, who's been doing uh, HIV drug resistance, not only founded the Stanford database, but keeps it updated at the highest scientific level. And of course, Seiku and David Beck from Liverpool, who bring us uh, with their team, the Liverpool website. And with that, I will thank you. Let me introduce our final speaker. Mark Boyd is the founding chair of medicine at the Lyle McEwen Hospital in Adelaide. He is an awardee of the Frank Fenner Prize for Advanced Research in Infectious Diseases by the Australian Asian Society for Infectious Diseases. 
Since moving to the University of Adelaide, he has launched a research program to explore how a better understanding of the social determinants of health can improve outcomes, particularly in areas of vulnerability. We're delighted to have Professor Boyd provide an update on long-acting therapy. Thank you for inviting me to give this update on long-acting antiretroviral therapy. These are my disclosures. Um, so in this uh, brief talk, I will mainly focus on treatment given we're in a treatment session, but if time allows, I'd also like to present some exciting data about prevention uh, and maybe mention a couple of agents in development that look like they'll continue in development and, and, and um, increase uh, the possibilities for treatment in the future. So this is a table taken from a review um, published about two years ago now, and you can see that actually there are a number of agents for which there is interest in developing long-acting forms of either existing agents and also uh, novel agents. For the purpose of this talk, and particularly with, with regard to treatment, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to focus on cabotegravir, um, and I'm also going to focus on rilpivirine, and these two agents are being used uh, in treatment, uh, have been used in treatment trials and uh, at the point of um, arriving in the clinic pretty soon. I'm also, if there's a chance, going to talk a little bit about this novel agent, which is now called Islatrovir, um, and also this novel agent, which is a capsid inhibitor, which also shows promise for both treatment and prevention. So dealing with cabotegravir and rilpivirine, I'm going to go straight to the phase three PIBL studies, the data from which uh, the company has now applied for a license to uh, have these used in the clinic by people with HIV infection. This is actually a combined presentation of the two studies, ATLAS, which stands for antiretroviral therapy as long-acting suppression, and FLARE, which was the first long-acting injectable regimen study. This is a busy slide, but um, I'll, just be, I'll just explain uh, the, the slight difference between the two. Uh, ATLAS was uh, a trial of 705 patients with antiretroviral experience who were receiving conventional triple oral combination therapy and were experiencing virological success. They were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either continue on their, the regimen in which they'd, which they'd come in on, or they were randomized to a four-week period of oral cabotegravir and rilpivirine to establish the safety and tolerability of that regimen for the participants. And then they went straight into um, a monthly injection of cabotegravir at a dose of 400 milligrams and rilpivirine 600 milligrams uh, with a, a loading dose initially of 600 milligrams cabotegravir and 900 milligrams of rilpivirine. The primary endpoint was week 48. By contrast, FLARE was done in antiretroviral therapy naive patients who were all placed for 20 weeks onto a combination of dolutegravir, abacavir, and lamivudine. Uh, and then once they had established that they were, undetect they were still undetectable four days before randomization, they were randomized either into the, to continue the oral dolutegravir, abacavir, and lamivudine, or they were randomized into similar, uh, in a similar way as in ATLAS, they were given a four week period of cabotegravir and rilpivirine given orally. And then they were, then they were put straight onto, uh, after a loading dose, onto cabotegravir long acting 400 milligrams with rilpivirine long acting 600 milligrams. And I should explain that this is two injections, one of cabotegravir, one of rilpivirine into each buttock. And that, the primary endpoint for that was at 48 weeks. I'm gonna shoot straight to, I guess, the money slide about the, the primary endpoint. And you can see, uh, I think the picture, a picture tells, paints a, a thousand, is, is worth a thousand words. You can see a, a very good result in terms of non-response. So patients without a viral load, less than 50 copies per mil, uh, at less than 2% in both the oral arm and the injectable arm. Uh, for the important secondary endpoint of undetectable, less than 50 copies. 93% um, in the injectable arm, 94% in, uh, in the oral arm. And if you look at these Christmas tree plots, uh, you can see that, uh, that the, the, the difference between the regimens uh, was very little. Um, the confidence interval crosses the point of no difference, but it doesn't cross either the 4% margin for the primary endpoint or the 10% non-inferiority margin for 
the uh, secondary endpoint. So a, a, a result completely consistent with non-inferiority of the injectable regimen over the daily oral regimen at one, one injections every one month. So during the period that the Atlas and Flare studies were producing that data, um, the company Vive, who's developing this combination, um, looked at the possibility uh, of whether the uh, intramuscular injection could be extended out to eight weekly rather than four weekly. The notion being, uh, common sense would say, that the less often you get an injection, uh, the more attractive the injectable regimen might be. And they did a smallish study where they suppressed antiretroviral naive patients in an oral regimen, uh, and then when they were suppressed, they switched them to either four weekly, which is seen in, the, in these dotted lines, or eight weekly intramuscular injections of cabotegravir or piperine. Um, and at the end of 96 weeks, actually, they found that the eight weekly regimen, 94% of people were suppressed uh, on the intention to treat analysis versus 87% in the four weekly intramuscular injection and versus 84% in those who maintained the oral. So certainly suggestive that the, the injection period could be extended out to eight weekly. Uh, that then led to the development of the ATLAS 2M study, the 2M meaning two monthly. Again, this was a, a large randomised multi-centre non-inferiority and open label study. It's fairly straightforward. Just explaining here that the people who are eligible to enrol were either those people in the initial ATLAS study who actually did go into the one month, the, the, the four weekly injection regimen. And they then went straight into this study if they were interested and they either went to eight weekly and for the eight weekly regimen, it's 600 milligrams of cabotegravir and 900 milligrams of rilpivirine given every, two, every eight weeks. And then in the other arm, they took the standard of care people from Atlas who were taking the, the, the conventional oral triple, triple therapy um, and they were, they were allowed to enrol, as well as a collection of other people who'd been on, who'd been suppressed on standard antiretroviral therapy. Those patients went to the four weekly lead in of the oral cabotegravir and rupivirine to establish safety and tolerability of that regimen. And then they were randomized to either, either go into the four, the, the eight week, uh, with the higher dose over two, over, over eight weeks, or the cabotegravir and rilpivirine at the 400, 600 milligrams dose um, for the four weekly regimen. And again, moving straight to sort of the primary endpoint, I don't need to say much more about this. The results were very similar to what you saw in Atlas and Flair a couple of, couple of um, slides ago with a demonstration of uh, very little in the way of, non, of, of virological non-response, less than 2% in either arm, and very similar, um, very similar result for virological success. Again, looking at the Christmas tree plots, uh, these results completely consistent with non-inferiority for the primary endpoint with a 4% non-inferiority margin, and the secondary endpoint um, non-inferior at, at, at a 10% margin. So a uh, very convincing result. Just looking into a bit more about safety and tolerability, obviously when we're talking about injectable regimens, we have the issue of injection and tolerability of injection, pain, discomfort, nodules. All of us will remember uh, perhaps the use of infuvatide and that led to a lot of problems with injection site reactions. Um, so it may well be one, um, one significant drawback to, to people offering, agreeing to, to, to use this regimen. This is actually a table of people excluding the injection site, which I'll, look into, I'll show you a bit more detail on in the next slide. And there's a fair bit of data here, but basically there were very little difference in terms of, um, you know, of adverse events. And there were certainly very few very serious adverse events. The most important thing I look for um, generally when I'm considering adverse events is the, the ones that actually lead people to withdraw from trial. People are prepared to put up with a few little bits little things that they attribute to their regimen, but the, the big question is whether they're so intolerable that they stop the treatment. And in this study, only five out of 522 patients, so less than 1%, withdrew because of uh, the, anti, the adverse events. Uh, slightly more in the four weekly, uh, withdrew at about 2%. And this is perhaps consistent, it's small numbers of course, but it's perhaps consistent with the idea that people who are getting a longer interval between injections are slightly more likely to put up with maybe some, some adverse events. 
if we look to the injection site reactions themselves, we see this very typical curve, which we've seen throughout this portfolio of studies for this combination of intramuscular therapy, where most people do experience a degree of uh, uh, mainly pain, I should say. You see most of them are pain, uh, but usually by the 48 week period, only about 20% of people are still complaining of that. Very little complaint of nodules, uh, some discomfort, but essentially it's pain. Um, the majority of those were grade one to two, so low grade adverse events, and they had a median duration of about three days um, before the pain settled down. Um, and that's uh, less than 2% of participants, as you can see, it discontinued for that for, for adverse events related to the injections. So that's, uh, that's pretty encouraging, I think. Um, there, is that, there were some virological failures and some people might ask, why would you get virological failures in a, in a regimen in which, um, in which people are um, basically given the therapy? I mean, this is directly observed therapy. In fact, it's directly administered therapy, if you like. Um, and the important thing is that there are only 10 out of over a thousand, so less than 1% of patients actually failed with, had confirmed virological failure and had resistance, but there was uh, resistance by the selection of non nuke mutations that would uh, confer resistance to rapivirine, and also uh, resistance to the integrase inhibitor. And of course, with the oral regimens, we've seen often very little in the way of resistance, almost none in some studies, in fact, none. Um, and so this does suggest with this longer acting regimen that if you do fail, you may well pick up some, in, some integrase resistance mutations. The important thing to say is that all these confirmed viral, vir, virological failures, all 10 of them still retain phenotypic sensitivity to dolutegravir. Uh, Viva studying this quite intensively and they're looking at things like what, is the, what are the main drivers of selective failure and resistance? So they're looking at baseline antiretroviral resistance subtype polymorphisms, body mass index and drug concentrations. And as it happens, I know David Margolis from Viv tomorrow evening UK time is actually presenting some of that, that deep dive data um, at the Glasgow HIV drug therapy meeting. So keep an eye out for that. What about preference? So this is, this is interesting. So if you look at this, this pie chart here, this is the proportion of patients in the eight week arm who had never experienced uh, the long, had never experienced intramuscular injection before. So they hadn't been in the Atlas study getting the full weekly injection regimen. And then nearly universally, all those patients preferred the injection to either oral or to oral um, antiretroviral therapy. Um, in the patients who had been in ATLAS, so therefore had been on the four-week regimen, again, nearly all, 94%, preferred to the eight-weekly regimen. Only 3% would, would want to go back to the one, sorry, the eight-weekly regimen. Only 3% said they'd prefer to go back to the four-weekly regimen. So again, consistent with that idea that the longer the dosing interval, the more attractive this, this um, therapy would be. Uh, I want to have a quick, quick, review of uh, cabotegravir and prevention. This is the HPT N083 study. This was really the headline news, I think, out of the AIDS conference in July. Um, it's a double blind, double, double dummy study. So, uh, and, and basically, to cut a long story short, there were a group that got active um, cabotegravir injection every two months for approximately three years. And there was a similar size group that got the same regimen, but with a life of intralipid solution that had no antiretroviral activity. What's important about this study and notable is that they actually enrolled the really high risk people that we often don't get much data on and whom we know uh, in treatment and prevention, we are the, 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 the don't do so well. So there were 12% of transgender women, which is a terrific result. It's very hard. It's been hard to enroll these people in the past. They were young people, uh, more than uh, two thirds were less than the age of 30. And they were also African-American, which is important. Half of them were African-American. So they really, really studied a population who were very difficult to prevent, in which to prevent HIV infection. And this is the headline slide. This is the thing that really impressed people. This was actually stopped early by a DSMV and an inter interim analysis because in, in the Trivada arm, which was daily Trivada, I should add, um, they had 39 infections in 3,187 person years compared to only 13 
uh, in a similar set of number of person years in the Cabotec review. In other words, a 66% reduction in risk of uh, incident infection. And that actually reached the criteria to be claimed as a superior result. So not just non-inferior, but superior. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a very interesting and exciting result that may well, uh, may well really pave the way for injectables as prevention to, uh, take a, to, to be implemented. Just finally, I want to talk about a couple of novel agents in development. The first one is a drug called lenacapavir. This is a capsid inhibitor, the first in class. And as you can see from this slide, it inhibits viral production at a number of points. Uh, so not just one single enzyme. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that doses of around 900 milligrams, it was very well tolerated, no serious or grade two and three or four adverse events. There were no adverse events that led to dis dis discontinuation. Discontinuation, although well, I should add, there's only 30 patients in this study and it's healthy volunteers. Um, and interestingly, at the 900 milligram dose, it looks like it maintains a pharmacokinetic profile consistent with uh, persistent suppression of sensitive virus out to six months, um, certainly three months and possibly out to six. So this is sort of an indication that we're, we will be seeing agents with the potential to be maybe dosed only six, only six monthly. And that's going to go in, into further development. Um, Gilead, who are developing this, uh, this agent, have done some simulation looking at how this might work in the clinic and they think maybe you could get a couple of 600 milligram doses over the first 48 hours, another one a week later, then you'd go to the 900 milligram dose at the end of a fortnight and you'd probably be, you'd be able to maintain the, a good pharmacokinetic profile with six monthly dosing thereafter. Uh, and this is a subcutaneous, by the way, a subcutaneous delivery, not intramuscular. Uh, the last agent I want to talk about is Islatravir, which was previously known as MK8591. Uh, this is also another interesting agent. It's a nucleoside inhibitor, but it also inhibits the translocase. So it, it acts at more than one site to inhibit viral replication uh, at reverse transcriptase. And what's interesting about this agent, uh, and given in, in, in an implant, which, which uh, is a drug eluting type implant, that the intracellular concentrations of the triphosphorylated form of Islatravir last well above uh, the, uh, the PK threshold for, for PrEP uh, out to 12 months. So this, is the sort of, this suggests that we could perhaps have at some stage in the future a PrEP agent that could be delivered um, simply yearly. Uh, this drug is also being used for treatment, but it's being given with duravarine in, on, a, on a daily basis. So not, as long, not, not, as long, not a long acting form with a much lower dose. So in conclusion, I think that the cabotegravir and rolpivirine combination has delivered some very interesting data and it's ready for prime time. Uh, it's already been approved mid-year in, in Canada and it's expected over the next six to 12 months, there'll be approvals in the US and, and in Europe. Um, whether the two months, so they're, at the moment they're applying for a, a four weekly dosing indication, Atlas 2M suggests that, um, that the agents should be given two monthly, but it's not clear whether that will be enough data to convince regulatory authorities. So they are, Viv are about to start enrolling a, a study called SOLAR, which will be a phase three study, comparing two monthly injection of cabotegravir and rolpivirin over uh, oral Bictavi in, in, in patients who've been fully suppressed um, on Victavi, and that should start in the next month or so. I think the thing that we'll, we will need, we need data on implementation about how intramuscular injections will work in clinics uh, and at, and at uh, for instance, in Australia, at, at general practices. Um, clearly, if, if the convenience of the dosing is not also convenient in terms of, of getting that dosing, um, you know, that would, be an, that would be a barrier. So there's a lot of interest in how this would work in the clinics around the world. Um, the HBTN083 study suggested that, mono, that monotherapy with cabotegravir is superior to Truvada in HIV prevention in high-risk groups, a very exciting result. Uh, there are new long-acting agents in development, and I've shown you a couple, and they have potential for use in treatment of prevention, and it'll be interesting to see those coming through the various phases, the, the phase one, two, and three studies. And then the potential for very long-acting ART, for instance, the Islatravir uh, drug elution um, and treatment of prevention is under investigation. And that could be drug eluting implants, it could be rate limiting semi permeable membranes, 
and also potentially in vaginal rings. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, both uh, Mark and uh, Kia for those wonderful talks. We have some time now for discussion. We already have a, a question from the audience, which deals with uh, resistance and the two drug regimen of dolutegavir and, and 3TC. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll start off with some discussion on uh, who are the patients who are most appropriate for giving this two drug regimen? Who would you think at this point um, would be less. And I, I think this question specifically relates to a patient who has the 184 mutation. So I guess if you saw on a resistance test that the patient had 184, would you give that patient uh, dilutegavir 3TC? And if the patient perhaps in the past had received a regimen with 3TC and had archive resistance, well, would this concern you? Um, maybe mark your thoughts and we'll, we'll ask you as well. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is an interesting area, I think, actually. Um, I, I think the short answer is no at the moment. Um, the tests, the, the studies that have been done uh, formally have uh, examined people without any evidence of a prior uh, M184 resistance mutation. And so, therefore, the data on these two drug regimens, the formal data, the data that's been submitted for filing. Um, doesn't contain people with that mutation and that's uh so i think the short answer is no what's interesting though is that there have been patients who have been given this regimen mainly in switch uh where they've been switched to this simplified regimen and they've known to have had m184v at baseline and they've done very well uh, the problem with most of those studies is they're highly selected highly biased um, there's one in particular from france can't quite remember the name now that's been shown for a little while, and that takes people with really quite extensive uh, antiretroviral exposure in the past, uh, who have become extremely adherent to their regimens because they understand the, the, the importance of that. They don't have many options left. And quite a number of those patients have the M184V, uh, and they, do, they seem to do well. Uh, but these are cohorts, they're biased, um, yeah. they're selected, so... I don't know you can necessarily extrapolate that to, to all patients. The one study I do often think about, though, in regard to this is the, the Moby Dip study, which was a study published in Lancet a couple of years ago, Lancet HIV, which showed that when you simplified people taking with, with background resistance, nearly all of them with an M184V, when you simplified them either to a boosted PI with just 3TC or boosted PI alone. And these were patients all who had virological suppression for some time. Um, there was an enormous difference between those who got the single drug and those who got the single, the single PI with the lamivudine, despite them all having M184V. And that sort of suggests to me that there, there are probably many people, given the dolutegravir has similar sort of barrier to resistance and potency as PIs, that probably many patients will do well I just think that the, the key is very good adherence. So, you know, I would consider it in someone with very good adherence if they really wanted it, but I guess I'd want to make sure that I could keep a pretty close eye on them to make sure something doesn't go wrong. Maybe Mark, on that point, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you in a second. So, you know, when we talk about suppressed patients, do, do you think that's a mark? Is it, is it a biological mark that these patients have suppressed the virus and the virus isn't replicating? Or is this more a marker of patients who simply take their drug? and they're adherent, and so they'll continue on afterwards. Uh, I, I think it's more the latter, Jonathan. I just think people who take the drug do pretty well. I mean, there is something very odd about the 3TC mutant, right? You get about a half log drop, even with yeah. its presence, despite the fact that all the, all the database will tell you it, it confers high level resistance. Um, so it is an unusual mutation. Um, uh, and maybe that's enough. Maybe that half log, uh, that half log that um, it will give you, despite the presence of the mutants, enough with a potent, uh, well-tolerated drug like dolutegravir is enough to maintain suppression. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be my guess. Yeah, no, definitely. Kia, Kia, what, what are your thoughts on these? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Mark that uh, for if we, you know, you have a. a uh, M184, we uh, you know mutant as baseline. I, I want I want uh, go for the first line initiated uh, option for sure. I think it's, it's not a, a good idea to do so. 
in terms of the, uh, the well-suppressed uh, individuals that uh, I think the data from Art Pro, although it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a very small uh, sample size. And, and, uh, but uh, what we learned from that is that if uh, the, the duration of viral suppression is long enough, it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, that should be fine. Uh, so, but again, I, I would say that uh, I would rather be careful to use the, uh, you know, the, this regimen in, in the background with uh, either history or uh, have been shown of uh, a mutation of 3TC drug resistance. Yeah. yeah, good points. I mean, I, I think that you know, for now, if we see it, we, we don't give it. I think this issue of archive mutations, the more I hear from people who understand more than me, you know, we sort of consider once mutation there, us resistance people love saying once it's there, it's always there. But when you speak to people who have been looking at reservoirs and so on, I remember Steve Deek saying, no, you go deeper and deeper. And someone who for 12 years hasn't had replicating virus, uh, it's very different than someone in six months. And maybe at yeah. that point. So I think you know there's there's more to, to, about this, and probably patients who for many many years haven't had it. Maybe that's responsible for some of the um, uh, the results that Mark was uh, was quoting. I think that's there'd be a lot of interest there. I just want to mention our friend Mark Weinberg, uh, the, our late friend who yeah. did so much work on 184, and we mm -hmm. learned uh, so much from him. So in this vein of uh, who are the patients who, who can or cannot, we did see the NICE data presented now and, and also earlier regarding patients with low CD4 counts, high viral loads. You know, both of you have a, a huge amount of experience in this, uh, both with this regimen and others. Uh, so who are the patients where you are comfortable? Where are the patients where you prefer not? Uh, Kia, as far as high viral load, low CD4, what are your sort of personal guidelines for, for dilutegavir 3TC? Yeah, um, yeah, I think, again, I mean, from the, the, the post hoc the subgroup analysis, uh, although it's a very small sample size, but I, I think this, the, 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 the masses is, uh, need to be taken into the account because uh, uh, if you look at many other study in the past, uh, either, you know, first line or second line in some regimen, right? Um, the, the lower the CD4 at baseline, the chance to see the proportion of patients with viral success is less. You look at all the, the trial in the past, of course, it depends on how arbitrarily, uh, you know, level of the cut of the viral load, you know, fine red copy, you know, maybe just arbitrary. Um, if you look at uh, that, uh, some of the report, again, case report is might not a good way to learn, but uh, at least tell us something. Uh, Opat, uh, you know, in, in the, the earlier session has presented three cases with three drug regimen. And, uh, you know, these three drug regimen rapidly develop a drug resistant. Two of them have myeloid load more than a million. And one is, you know, close to a finite copy. And all of them have myeloid CD4 below 100. So, you know, so, so I think this, you know, even three drug regimen baseline, really clean on, you know, mutation, is still a risk there because we, yeah. we don't know what the, the reservoir of the drug resistant that hiding in there. You know, the higher replication rate, you have a higher risk of uh, to see, uh, you know, mutation uh, developing very quickly. And, and other factor that we might not uh, thinking about is maybe because of the adherent issue as well that we don't, didn't take, take into the account. So I think uh, I will be very cautious to go with a uh, very low CD4 cell count and very high viral load. So how high, how low? Yeah, what, what are your numbers? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, everything is arbitrary. Um, I think it's just borderline 200, maybe okay. But I think if with anything 100 uh, below 100, 150, I will be mm -hmm. have a big concern. And the viral loss more than, you know, high up close to a, a million, I think. Uh, my, I prefer to go with three drug regimen at, be, at the beginning, and then you can, you know, you can switch later on when the viral loss has been well suppressed. So that may be what I, I would do. Great. Mark, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think what Kiet says is, is very reasonable. I'm perhaps a, little, a bit less conservative. I mean, I, I, 
again, I think it's all about taking the drug. Right? I think that's the really critical thing, whether you're low or high. You've got to remember, as Kia pointed out very, very pertinently in, in, in those examinations of CD4 and viral load and you know, undetectability, um, quite small sample, particularly for the CD4, I think it was like 25 patients overall. So it's you know, small numbers, hard to really pin a lot on that. Uh, the other thing that always bothered me about the analysis is this, looking at viral load and CD4, to me, they must interact. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. it always bothers mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. I would really rather see just one or the other rather than doing both. Yeah. Because, you know, there's clearly a relationship between height of viral load and, 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 and CD4 level, right? Um, yeah. I, you know, if I have someone who I think is local and will come back and see me, I mean, I generally start people on a regimen and get them back in a month just to see how they're getting along make sure there hasn't been some mistake in how they take the tablet and just check adverse events. And I, I would probably take a viral load at that point. Uh, I can mm -hmm. get them back pretty quickly. They come back in about a week. And, you know, so I wouldn't be too bothered about starting someone on, on, on Devato or Dolutegravir 3TC because um, I doubt that there will be any, any, nothing bad will happen as long as they're taking their tablets or even if they're not taking them very well over that first four-week period. Uh, and if they like the regimen and it's not, it's very, and it's well tolerated, which of course it is, um, uh, I, you know, I don't think they're going to come to any grief. And if they've dropped a couple of logs in that time, then I'm happy to pursue it. Um, but certainly it's, it's, there's no, no reason why you couldn't start with three, be assured that they've become undetectable and then drop it to two. Yeah. I think that's a strategy a lot of folks actually are doing, yep. uh, that's that seems to work well. So I, I, intuitive to me, the high viral load has always made sense. I mean, we always see that patients with very high light viral loads, we have difficulties. The CD4 yeah. is always a little bit more of a riddle. Why, you know, I, we did ages ago uh, lymph node biopsies, and we saw how you know patients with very low CD4 is often the lymph nodes uh, right. grows and maybe penetrate. What I'm you know, a question which I which I struggle with, and since I have both you guys here, I'm going to actually indulge myself. You know. Well, what about a patient who actually had a very low CD4 count, right? So the patient, we were called to the ward a decade ago, OI, 10 CD4 count, two yeah. cells. We finally got the patient up to have, you know, is that the same as a patient who's come down? Are we comfortable giving that patient the take for three piece? You know, this, what do you guys think? It's, it's, it's a tough question, but I'm just an example of a, of, of a two drug regimen. Is, is that the same? Is that different? Um, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable to do that. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I'd make the point about CD4 and viral load interaction. I think it's more the viral load, to be honest. Um, I mean, look, you know, the, the problem with the, the, using the Gemini studies is that they had a cutoff of 500,000 for entry. So, I mean, technically, if you're being completely sensible, I suppose, and not taking any risk, then if someone has a viral load over 500,000, then that's, that's a reasonable chance with someone who's got 10 or zero CD4s you'd probably start with a triple regimen. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, again, I mean, if someone insisted, they said to me, look, I don't want that doctor. I, I've heard about his yeah. TAF and, you know, I'm worried about putting on weight. You know, can I have a go at the D3? I'd say, yeah, sure. sure. Um, you know, sure. I'm happy to negotiate with patients. And I said, as long as you come back and we make sure it's working in a month, I'm, 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 I'm fine with that. Cool. Well, Kia, your, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I'm a bit uh, conservative, so I, I think would love to start <laughs> with three drugs at the beginning. Um, I think I think C4 and the viral load is a Miller phenomenon. I mean, if you if you have a very low CD4 in general, you, you're going to see quite a, a high level of viral load. You know, right. remember that in, in some setting in this region is, uh, I, I saw some of the north from our audience, the Philippine, they don't have uh, viral load monitoring. Right. right. I mean, and and even uh, the CD4, it did not really have a viable, uh, you know, very frequently. So, so I think it's, it's a challenge as well to, to think about uh, the setting here. And the other, uh, the reason that to be, uh, uh, I uh, be more conservative because I think the DTG containing regimen is one of the best. If you fail it, although it's a minority of people fail it. But people, we have a hard time to go with the second option with boosted PI, you know, and with NNRTI. So drug drug interaction in the long run and, and blah blah blah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, for the um, uh, 
uh, uh, switch uh, option is uh, it's more comfortable for the naive. We need to make sure that they they really going to have an more than ninety nine percent chance to to be successful rather than you know uh, you know more than one percent to fail. So anyhow, it's just a, a way of thinking. It's just a more conservative. Maybe I'm getting older though. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I think the, these are these are excellent considerations. You know, Mark, you enticed us with with the long acting, the IM, which you know I think people are excited about. We're getting some very nice questions also in that regard. So I, right. I think people are, are asking both about you know actually the the you know the AEs. People, as someone who's actually done these studies, you know, what do you actually see with people going in? And also, you know, regarding the patients, the question of who are the patients who will most benefit. There's a question here about pediatric use. I think all of us know. You know, teenagers are challenging yep. pediatrics. Yep. So, but you know, who are who are the patients? You know, who would you treat? Different groups. Be be interesting to hear in your personal thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. It, it's hard to know whether this is going to be something that really a lot of people will go for, or whether it's going to be a very niche market. And I don't think really any of the research to date has really helped us. I don't think we'll find out until it kind of gets to the clinic, um, because of course the people we've asked about what did you like and what uh, what frequency did you like and were people who went into the studies knowing they had a pretty good chance of being randomized to these drugs so yeah. it's a very select population it doesn't represent the general population right because clearly there are going to be people that wouldn't go near an injection right who hate needles so it, it's i think we've it, re it really won't be until these drugs are licensed and i think the only place they're licensed just now are canada i'm not sure if there's any um Mm -hmm. Any early experience with Sharon Wormsley or someone like that? Uh, maybe the US next year, right? And, and maybe Europe at the end of the year and probably in Australia next year. So we're going to find out in the next 12 months. Um, so, I mean, I think there are, when I say, to, I've got an interesting group of patients where I am. I, I'm not in, I moved from Sydney, which is a very gay centric, very, a uh, lot of men, um, men who have sex with men live there. It's a, it's a very uh, liberal part of the world and, and, and people talk. A lot of people are HIV positive in that community. They talk about the drugs. They know about what's coming. Uh, the people I treat are very different. I'm in a very disadvantaged part of uh, Adelaide, one of the most disadvantaged uh, urban areas in the country, uh, very poor, uh, lots, of, lots of disadvantages, high unemployment, all that kind of stuff, high rates of domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera, or the whole the whole bag of bad determinants of health, poor determinants of health. And um, so they're a very different group. And when I mentioned that, you know, injections are coming, none of them have ever gone, oh God, I wouldn't have an injection. They said, oh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, or maybe, maybe that might be good. So I get the feeling that some of my people might, you know, might actually go for the, go for the injection and maybe they're not too bothered by the needle, right? Uh, but, but as I say, only time will tell. In terms of children, of course, it would be very attractive, but and you might know more me, than me, Jonathan, but certainly there are no published studies or studies that I'm aware of being conducted by the looking at adolescents no. uh, for treatment. Do you know? Is there anything happening? Are the, are the no, but I, I think, it, you know, sometimes we do get the bridging studies down to like the age of 12. And I think yeah. that's, that's, that would be interesting to see because that would be a challenging population. Akia, before we run out of time, I want to hear your thoughts. We, I, I could go on all, you know, all afternoon, but I think we're, we're getting small. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on the patients uh, for, for the long acting IM and uh, we'll need to sum up. Oh yeah, um, I, th I think the, the first thing, I mean, uh, in, if you look at the, most of the Western study, I mean, the people were really welcoming to get this type of you know, option. Uh, but I think there's, there are still uh, quite a number of uh, limitations or challenges uh, uh, need to be uh, considered. I think the first thing is the cost. I, I don't believe that cost will be cheap. I mean, it's very unlikely. I mean, the, the, cap, sure. the capacity, production capacity, probably a problem, I believe. Uh, second thing is they still need to address the lead-in option. I mean, how, how long you really need the lead-in option, you know, uh, you know, right now, uh, for the Swiss uh, study, you you at least need a four weeks bleeding, which is just, uh, you know, and and for the in that, you know for for the naive population, maybe you need longer to to make sure that the viral suppression is is there before you starting the injection. So bleeding up a problem. The, the the other thing is the, uh, but this probably more than in the prevention part of the prep is the the tail. 
the long tail issue, right? Because the tail is, uh, I think uh, the the 077 study have shown that uh, more than 50% of population, the tail is more up, up to a year, so maybe more longer. If they stop the injection, so what the tail coverage that you need to do? So, so quite a number of uh, uncertainty that need to be addressed. Mm. Yeah, you're quite no right question. on all those things, Pierre. Yeah. Oh, no question, right? I mean, yeah, we've run out of time, which is a pity, because I would love to, to hear both you and Mark more about the tail, since it has both resistance and <laughs> adherence. And yeah. So we'll have to keep that for next time, but it's 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 an excellent point. Uh, I think we're, we're on time for closure, so I'll, I'll need to thank uh, Kia and Mark. Thanks for a great discussion and great talks. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. We'll thanks for the opportunity, for Jonathan. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, everyone. Yeah. Bye now. All right. All right. So uh, with that, friends, we're going to move to closing uh, our uh, workshop. It's been a wonderful two days. Uh, today we had wonderful speakers. Let me look at the whole group of speakers we've had uh, over the last uh, two days. And uh, this is a good time for a special thank you to Professor Kia Rakshwankaram, who really uh, is behind choosing the speakers, choosing the topics, putting the sessions together. I think Kia did a fantastic job. and. Uh, I'd like to say a special thank you to him for, for virtually hosting us in Bangkok, but more importantly, really guaranteeing these wonderful two days. So, so thank you, Kia. Uh, and thank you to all our speakers and to the questions from the participants and the great discussion. Uh, also a good time to thank uh, our sponsor. So a big thank you to Vive. Uh, it's an independent educational grant. So of course they have nothing to do with the program. They just give us the money, which is the way I think uh, we like it. So thank you Vive uh, for the support. I, I think we did a lot of good education. For those who want a certificate of attendance, there'll be a, a survey provided. Once you uh, submit that, uh, we'll be happy to provide uh, the certificate. And uh, for those who were not able to watch or would like to watch again, uh, at this website of academic and medical education, you can actually find the material as well as material of a lot of other programs. So for those uh, where the hours weren't convenient, uh, you're definitely uh, welcome. We do have the meet the speakers right afterwards and hurry up and log on because it will fill up and this is an opportunity to have a, a small virtual group. Um, and we have the the form the epic the epic meeting coming up but i would be grateful for those who attended uh, if you could uh, provide an uh, a submission of your survey because we really do learn from that and with that i'm going to thank everybody uh, thank you all uh, i think we had a great two days and we'll look forward uh, to next time thank you very much <laughs>